Hello, hello. Welcome to Amazed Live. I'm Christine Co. I guess the de facto host, and I am so excited to be with Dan Rice today. Hi, Dan. Good morning. How are, or I guess good afternoon now, right? Good afternoon. Yeah. And this is um this is new to you, right? This is your first Facebook Live. It is. Are, are you to be for Amazed? Yeah, I know you. You are so wonderful, and I had um, the pleasure. I've worked with you for a couple of years now, but had the pleasure of finally meeting you in person in the fall, which was yeah. wonderful. Was so fun. I'm so so glad you agreed to uh, let me get you on the broadcast. So I would love, as we're kind of waiting for people to um, show up and get oriented, I would just love for you to give a little bit of background about yourself and the work that you do um, at Answer. Sure. So I am the director of training at ANSWER, and ANSWER is a national sexuality education organization based out of Rutgers University in New Jersey. And I mostly focus on providing training for professionals who teach sex ed either in the classroom or maybe in after school community based programs, things of that nature. Uh, as I said, it's a national organization, so I fly all over the country, work with teachers uh, all over, and um, just really enjoy the work that we do. And in, a, in my role in Amaze is sort of as a content expert. And so I work with other content experts to write sort of the background briefs as we call them, to give all the most important information and content that we want to include in the Amaze videos, and then work with the animators to make sure that we're hitting all the important key points with them and make sure that uh, you know we're using inclusive language and all the things to make sure that we're really getting the most broad audience as possible when we do our Amaze videos. That's awesome. You know, I've said this to your colleague or our colleague, Nora Gelpern in the past, but like you guys are just my absolute heroes. <laughs> um, I mean, you are like, this work is so crucial and you are literally like, you know, in the, in the field, you know, doing the work and getting it done. So I can't thank you enough for all that you do. It's so awesome. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so, you know, we, this over the last month since the, the launch of Amaze Junior, you know, we've been sharing a lot of different types of content stuff, you know, that's for parents for how to have hard conversations about really basic stuff that I don't know, it feels like it shouldn't be hard anymore, but it's still hard for a lot of people. And um, I wanted to talk about the whole babies conversation, which is, you know, inevitable, but still something that people struggle with, and especially kind of a little bit later on. Um, you know, how it how that conversation has changed over time. So I wanted to start out, you know, in one of our earlier broadcasts, we were talking about uh, with another guest, you know, the whole where do babies come from um, situation. Um, but it, there's actually a distinction between that and what we're going to talk about today, which is um, the question of how babies are made. So I would love if you could kind of give some framing um, context for why those two questions are actually different. Sure. So the where question really gets at sort of this idea of behind existence, right? So as young people are starting to develop, they may be looking at old photos and parents may be saying things to them like, oh, that was before you were born. And so they start to become aware of this time frame where they didn't exist. And so they're going to start to ask questions about things of that nature, right? Versus the, um, you know, how are babies made, which really, when we take off what I like to call our adult lenses, um, is really the, the biology behind how um, the sperm and the egg meet and ultimately develop into a fetus, right? And so I often say to parents or ed even educators when I'm working with them to say, you know, we will sometimes hear things or see things through our adult lens that are really very innocent when, when young children and so the question may be where do babies come from or where did I come from or how are babies made? And we think they may be asking a question about sex, but really what they're asking is a question about biology. Right. Um, I just I don't know if this is somebody, you know, but I just wanted to pop up that Caitlin Killalay has joined our conversation and she says hi. So hi, Caitlin. Hi, Caitlin. <laughs> um, welcome. And if anybody who's joining the broadcast, actually, sorry, Dan, I'll just interject for one second has questions for Dan, please fire them off. He is the expert here. I'm just the host. <laughs> and um, if you come to this broadcast later, which I know a lot of people do, please also drop your questions and I will see to getting them answered. Um, so 
Dan, you're talking about actually this this whole adult lens situation is, uh, and I think that's the first time I've heard that phrase, and it's really really appropriate. This is a big one because um, I, you know, as I've been working on this project, um, one of the things that's cropped up in comments and conversations is um, parents saying, "Well, like, why would I even have to use these terms and talk about these things? Why can't kids be kids? Um, I just want them to be." like young. So what would you, what would you, how would you respond to that? Yeah. So uh, we'll take it back to, you know, just the way we use the correct terminology for other parts of our body, right? We call our nose, our nose and our eyes, our eyes. And we use the correct terminology for other parts of our body. And when we use euphemisms for the genital area, which sometimes people do because they feel uncomfortable saying things like vulva or penis, it can send a message to young people that those are maybe inconsequential parts of our body or maybe uh, that those are things that we don't talk about. And that can sort of send a shaming message to young people that we shouldn't be talking about our genitals um, and that it's not important to know the correct names for them. And, and that can carry, you know, with them through a lifetime, through a lifespan. And as they grow up, they continue to carry that thought that maybe I shouldn't be talking about those things which really plays into their sexual health as they start to get older and they don't feel comfortable talking to doctors or healthcare providers about their sexual and reproductive health. And particularly, we wanna make sure that they have the language um, to, to be able to talk to their healthcare providers about those things and be able to explain things in a medically accurate way. Right, okay, so can you, um, you know, just for kind of like a traditional, uh, like, let's say just a traditional mom and dad kind of situation where, you know, a sibling is on the way and um, a little kid asks, you know, what would your, so if the first kid, whoever the kid is, you know, asks, okay, well, how, how is that baby that's growing in you? How did it get there? How was that made? Um, what's some sample language that a parent could use? Sure. So uh, a parent could use sim uh, some language, um, very scientific language, really, it, it just by saying something as simple as, well, there's a cell, that's called a sperm. And then there's another cell that's called an egg. And when the two join together, they actually start to form a baby. A lot of times for a young child, that's that simple. That's enough. <laughs> it's enough, right? They're like, okay, can I have my sandwich now? <laughs> you just keep it moving, right? Most parents are concerned that this is going to ask to the question, well, then how does the baby get out, right? If, if the baby, and, and I'll back up to say, we should be talking about the uterus, right? Uh, using those correct terms as opposed to saying the baby's in mommy's belly because I have teenagers, I've seen teenagers that I've worked with who think that the digestive system and the reproductive system are one in the uh, because they've heard all their lives that the baby's in the belly, right? And so we really need to sort of differentiate, talk about how the two are different. And again, young kids don't sexualize uterus or vulva or penis they're just other parts of the body, right? That's again, taking off our adult lenses and just using proper names for them. It's adults that often attach that sexual stigma to those body parts, right? Not young people. And so if we just say, well, there's, there's this part of the body that's called the vagina and part of it is connected to the uterus and part of it is connected to an opening between a woman's legs and the baby goes through the vagina and that's how the baby comes out. That's a very simple sort of developmentally appropriate way of talking about this using correct terminology that sometimes adults feel really uncomfortable with because we've provided some kind of, you know, we've looked at it through our adult lenses and there's some kind of sexualization of the term vagina or vulva or penis. But really, if we just are using the correct terminology for those body parts from the time young kids are very little, we've normalized that and we've sent a, a positive message to them and it's non-shaming. Yeah, yeah. Those parts of their body. Yeah, I wanna loop back to something really important that you said right at the beginning of this this piece, which was that, um, you know, sometimes you can just give that first simple bit and that's enough and then they'll want their sandwich or whatever. Um, because um, I think a lot of people, a lot of parents feel like they need to like give a huge explanation yes. and and also worry about that. And so one of the things that I've learned through this work is that, you know, some parents fear they're going to give too much information. And what I've learned from, you know, you and the team is that, you know, kids will just tune you out when they, <laughs> right? Is yeah. that correct? You know, if they're, if they're done, they're done. Yes. Yeah. So a lot of times a very brief develop, developmentally appropriate answer is all they need. 
they just want their curiosity, you know, spoken to, um, especially if it's about a time when they didn't exist, right? They're just starting to, you know, realize, oh, wow, there was a time where I wasn't around, you know, as they're looking through pictures or things like that. And just a short, simple answer of, you know, well, that was before you were born. And, you know, then they may ask the question, you know, how are babies made or where do babies come from, which we talked about. And just answering in a short, developmentally appropriate way often is a good enough answer for young people. Mm -hmm. Ask some follow-up questions. And in those follow-up questions, you should continue to follow that pattern of short, developmental, appropriate answers until basically they're, you know, all their curiosity is satisfied. All right, very good. Okay, so how babies are made has evolved over time. And I would love for you, so, you know, I we have, you know, family and friends where in vitro has been, you know, in the mix. And so I sort of feel like I tried to be brief and, and but I probably went on too long when I was trying to explain it to my kids. And I'm sure some of it went over their heads or they just got bored or they wanted their sandwich or whatever. So I would love if you could, give some sample language um, for how to keep it really simple and direct if a parent wants to explain um, in vitro to their kid. Sure. So the language really is the same, right? All babies are are made the same way, right? That the sperm and the egg meeting. So talking about it in the form of in vitro, we may just talk about those using those same cells and talking about the fact that they may be joined outside of the body by a medical professional or a doctor and put inside the uterus where the baby would then develop, right? So again, we're just using that simple concept of the sperm and the egg joined together, it goes inside the uterus and that's where the baby develops. But we could talk about the fact that it happens outside of the body with a doctor's help and then is placed inside the uterus. So that would be one way of talking about it. Um, one thing that we're really trying to be aware of in a maze is that there are lots of different families and families are, are formed in a lot of different ways. And so we're actually in the process of working on a video for our maze group, which is, you know, older 10 to 14 year olds, but really talking about how families may develop in same sex families. And so we'll talk about things like in vitro. We may talk about things like surrogacy. We're gonna talk about adoption. We're gonna talk about blended families. We're gonna talk about um, foster children, you know? And so we just really want to acknowledge that there's a variety of ways that families can happen and a variety of ways that children can come to be to, to their parents, right? And so, um, you know, talking about all those different ways can be helpful as well. This is great. Um, and now I'm realizing that I probably did try to give too, inf too much information when I had this conversation with my kids, because I think I was also trying to explain the concept of infertility, which was very confusing. And mm -hmm. anyway, very good learning experience. Now, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought up um, that was actually my next question was to talk um, more about also same sex couples, because if some of if I think back to what we talked about earlier and, you know, a kid has said, OK, they've identified um, you know, a sperm and an egg come together and they know that comes from a male and a female. If you have a same sex couple, like how would you explain that in really simple terms? Yeah. So in those terms, we would talk about there still would need to be a sperm that, that came from a male body and a, a, an egg that came from a female body. We may talk about it in terms of in vitro, right? That they were joined together by a doctor and then put into the uterus, right? Where it would grow. Um, and then I would just talk about, you know, how all families are you are different and all families are good. Uh, just really talking about just ex um, exposing them to just the wealth and the diversity of different families, because as they go get older and they go into school, they're going to be exposed to all of these different types of families as well. Right. And so if we normalize that from a very young age, I think it, uh, we do a good service for uh, children. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, and uh, as we've talked about at a maze on the team and elsewhere, you know, that I feel like now in this current life we're all living, there are, there are so many touch points. There are so many, you know, teachable moment touch points, whether it's on TV or in the media or at the grocery store, that there are so many things you can latch on to, um, to help kids just kind of develop an inclusive perspective. Um, yeah. So I would like to, I know uh, your time is precious and I'm so appreciative you are here, uh, but I would like to close by um, getting, I don't know, maybe one or two of your favorite pro tips for how to help um, parents kind of get over this 
anxious, awkward feeling they have um, about thinking about talk to, talking to their kids about this stuff, especially young kids. I mean, I think a lot of parents are kind of like, they can understand talking to tweens and teens, but the idea of talking to preschool or elementary school kids freaks them out. So yeah. what would be some kind of, you know, just your kind of top pro tips, um, you know, for getting going and finding the confidence to do that? Sure. Uh, I'd say the first one, the most important one, and it, I talked about this earlier, is taking off those adult lenses, right? Seeing things, uh, seeing the questions young people ask from a point of innocence rather than sexualizing the question, right? So questions about where do babies come from, how are babies made, are often questions about biology. And so if you approach them in that way, they become a little bit more comfortable to answer. Um, the next thing I'd say is keep it simple, keep it brief. Young people will ask follow-up questions if they have follow-up questions, but we want to make sure that we're keeping things developmentally appropriate. Uh, we want to answer their questions, but it doesn't require us to sort of give them the whole world of an explanation around it. Answer their questions in a very um, direct and specific way and keep them simple, keep them brief, and follow that same path in, in any follow-up questions that they may ask. And then I guess, you know, I, I sort of have to give the plug here to Amaze and Amaze Junior. My my final pro tip would be to really sit down and look at some of the Amaze Junior videos for parents. Uh, they give lots of really great tips and give you some ideas for how to approach the conversation. And then go over to some of those videos that are designed for young people in Amaze Junior. Sit down, watch those kid, watch those videos with your kids and use the tips that you've learned in the parent videos to have those conversations. I think that is fantastic. Those are three like great closing rally cries. And I, you know, I know personally that I've learned so much from the work and from you guys. Um, so it, I think it's totally, it really does work to level up your communication game parents. I trust me. Um, Dan, this was just such a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy training schedule to share your, your wisdom um, with everybody. It was such a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for having me, Christine. It was great. All right, take care. Take care.